Hi students, welcome to Sunil tutorial. I am Sunil Manwani and today we will be doing this chapter called as some basic concepts of chemistry. Now let's see this. Some basic concepts of chemistry, let us see what are the various laws that were put forward by different scientists. Right? Now the first law that was put forward was called as Gay-Lussac's law. Now um, this chemistry pertains to before the discovery of atom. So before the discovery of atoms, scientists wanted to find out how chemical combination takes place. So the first scientist who thought about how chemical combination, how do elements combine to give you compounds, the first scientist who thought about it, his name was Gay Lussac, and his law is called as Gay Lussac's law. Now Gay Lussac's guys, write this down please. Gay Lussac's law states that in a chemical combination, whenever there is a chemical combination, first I'll give you the law and then I'll explain it to you. In a chemical reaction gaseous reactants and products maintain a simple whole number ratio by volume to one another. When measured at same temperature and pressure. Right? This is what was Gay Lussac's law. So Gay Lussac's law stated that in a chemical combination, gaseous reactants and products maintain a simple whole number ratio by volume to one another when measured at same temperature and pressure. Now what does this mean? Guys, let's try to understand this. What does this mean? It means that when two atoms combine with each other, they will always combine in the ratio of whole number and never combine in the ratio of fraction. For example, guys, now please pay attention here. For example, I can say that for example, let's assume that formation of water. In the case of formation of water, you would have two hydrogen atoms combining with one oxygen atom to form a water molecule. Right? What is the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen here? 2 is to 1. Fine, do we get this thing here? That means here you have two hydrogen atoms combining with one oxygen atom to give you one water molecule this is going to be 2H2O plus O2 which is going to give you 2H2O right so you would have two volumes of hydrogen combining with one how do I know two volume this is that two volume two volume of hydrogen combining with one volume of water to give you two volumes of water. Two volumes of hydrogen combined with one volume of oxygen to give you two volumes of water. But Gay-Lussac said that the two reactants will always combine in a ratio of whole numbers. This will always be in the ratio of whole numbers. This will never be in the ratio of fraction. That is what is Gay-Lussac's law. So Gay-Lussac's law states that whenever gaseous reactants combine with each other, they will combine in the ratio of whole numbers. They will combine in the ratio of whole numbers. Fine, do we get this thing here? Here, you can see that if I take the product also, they said that gaseous reactant and product maintain a simple whole number ratio. Here the ratio is 2 is to 1 is to 2. The reactants are in the ratio of 2 is to 1. The reactants and products are in the ratio of 2 is to 1 is to 2. So the reactants and products maintain a ratio of whole numbers. That is what is Gay-Lussac's law. Right? So do you understand this? So Gay-Lussac stated that in any chemical equation, the reactants and products will always be whole number. They will not be a fraction number. That's the simple part about it. Right? You will never have fraction atoms combining with each other. You will have a whole atom combining with each other. And the ratio will always be in terms of whole number. 
it will never be in terms of decimal, right? Next, this was the first sign, this we lose that now. Next, let's see what is an atom. Now, as per a scientist called as Avogadro, how did he define an atom? According to Avogadro, he defined an atom as a smallest indivisible uncharged particle of an element. He defined atom as smallest indivisible and uncharged particle of an element. which can take part in chemical reaction which can take part in chemical reaction and may or may not exist in independent may or may not have an independent existence and may or may not have an independent existence. This is the old definition of atom before the discovery by Darwin. Before the discovery of atom by Darwin. So, according to Avogadro, he dis defined atom as the smallest indivisible uncharged particle of an element which can take part in chemical reaction and which may or may not have an independent existence. So he said that if I take any element and if I break it into small pieces, guys try to understand this explanation, if I take this, if I break it I will get two halves, if I go on breaking that, I will go on getting a smaller and smaller half. At a certain point of time I will not be able to break this anymore. I will get the smallest particle of this element which cannot be divided anymore. This smallest particle of an element would then be called as, as an atom, right? This smallest particle of the element is capable of taking part in chemical reaction. It may or may not have an independent existence. I may be able to see that small particle or may, I may not be able to see the small particle. Fine, do we understand this? So that was the definition of atom. That was the old definition of atom, okay? Now if that was the atom, then what was molecule? As per Avogadro, what was a molecule? A molecule was the smallest particle of an element or compound which can take part in chemical reaction and has a free existence and can be broken into atom. Right? According to him, a molecule is smallest particle of an of an element or a compound which can take part in chemical reaction which can take part in chemical reaction it has free existence and can be broken into atoms. That's how you define a molecule. Right? So as per Avogadro, he said that what is a molecule? Like what a molecule? What is a molecule? It is just instead of taking an element, if I take a compound and if I break it down, the smallest particle of that compound would be called as molecule. It will always, you will always be able to see that smallest particle. Right? Do we get this thing clear? And if I break that down further, what I'll get is atom. So if I can break a substance and I get a smaller substance, then that will be called a molecule. 
But if I break a substance and it is not breakable, I cannot break that any further, then that would be called as an atom. Molecules can be broken into atoms, atoms cannot be divided, atoms are indivisible. Remember people, this is the old theory, because later when I teach you atomic theory, we will see that atoms are broken down into protons, neutrons and electrons. So this is before uh, the electronic theory of atom was discovered by Dalton. So we are seeing all these are old theories of chemistry. Okay. So do we understand what does Avogadro say about atom and molecule? On the basis of this theory of atom and molecule, he came up with a law which is called as the Avogadro's law. He said that equal volume of gases under same conditions of temperature and pressure contain same number of molecules. Avogadro's law states that equal volume of gases, of all gases, under the same conditions of temperature and pressure contain same number of molecules. That is what is Avogadro's law. That means if I take Christ, he says that equal volume of gas. Let us assume that I take a container. Let us assume that this the volume of this container is say, let us arbitrarily take any volume. Say let us say the volume of the container is 5 meter cube. Right? I take another container. The volume of this container is also 5 meter cube. Let us assume I fill the first container with oxygen gas. Let us assume I fill the second container with hydrogen gas. Right? These two gases are different. Now I fill the first container with oxygen gas. Right? Oxygen atom is bigger, hydrogen atom is smaller. Let us assume that this has saved arbitrarily for explanation purpose let's assume that this has thousand molecules right when you find out when you count the number of molecules in the second container you will see that the second container will also have thousand molecules so he said that if you take equal volume see the volume is equal i've taken equal volume if you take equal volume of any two gases or any gas for that matter then equal volume of same of gases under conditions of same temperature and pressure I am keeping them besides each other I am keeping them at same temperature and pressure they will contain the same number of molecules this is called as Avogadro's law so Avogadro's law says that whatever be your gas they will contain the same number of molecules if their volumes are equal so if volumes are equal then the number of molecules that are present in them will be equal. If volumes are equal then number of molecules present in them will be equal. Fine, do we understand this? Is this understood by us guys? Let's move on ahead. Next. Let's see some other concepts. What is atomicity? Now, what do you mean by atomicity? Suppose if I consider a molecule of an element, the number of atoms that make molecule of an element or molecule of a compound is called as its atomicity. One molecule of any substance is made up of some number of atoms. Let's assume a molecule of a substance is made up of three atoms. The number of atoms that make a molecule of a substance is called as its atomicity. Atomicity is the number of molecules, or sorry, the number of atoms that make molecule of a substance. Right? You just write this down. Define atomicity. Atomicity, the number of atoms. Number of atoms. 
in a molecule of an element is called as its atomicity. So how do I define atomicity? The number of atoms that would make one molecule. Fine, you get this thing here. Next, the next concept that we have is absolute density. What do we mean by absolute density? Absolute density guys is defined as the weight in grams of 1 liter of gas at normal temperature and pressure. If I weigh a gas, if I weigh uh, 1 liter of gas at normal temperature and pressure, what is normal temperature? 0 degree centigrade. What is normal pressure? 760 mm of mercury is called as normal pressure. So what is absolute density of a gas? It is the weight I just explain this to you again. The weight in grams of one liter of gas at NTP. That is what is absolute density. If I weigh one liter of gas at normal temperature and pressure, whatever weight I get, that is called as its absolute density. You want to ask me something? What is this NTP? NTP stands for normal temperature and pressure. What is NTP? is nothing but normal temperature and pressure. We generally conduct all experiments on gases at a particular temperature and pressure and that particular temperature and pressure is universally called as normal temperature and pressure. Your normal temperature is 0 degree Celsius or 273 degree Kelvin. There are two methods to measure temperature. One is Celsius scale, the other is the Kelvin scale. And your normal pressure is 760 mm of mercury. So if I conduct the experiment, when the pressure is 760 mm of mercury and temperature is 273 Kelvin or 0 degree Celsius, then if I keep the temperature at 0 degree centigrade, if I keep the pressure at 760 mm of mercury, and if I take 1 liter of gas, and if I weigh it on a weighing scale, right, if I weigh it, whatever is the weight I get in grams is called as the absolute density of that gas. Do we understand what is absolute density, right? Copy this much. Have you copied this? Can I work the board out, guys? Okay. Now, besides that, let's also find out what is vapor density. Right? What is vapor density? Vapor density is defined as the weight of a given volume of gas at NTP to the weight of same volume of hydrogen gas at NTP. If I compare, see, in simple language, what is vapor density? Vapor density is nothing but the comparison of the absolute density of a gas to that of hydrogen. If I compare the absolute density of a gas with that of hydrogen, what I get is called as vapor density. It is nothing but the weight of a gas at NTP, weight of a given volume of gas, weight of given volume of gas at NTP divided by weight of same volume of hydrogen gas at NG. So if I compare the absolute density of a gas with that of hydrogen, what I get is called as vapor density. So what is vapor density? In It is nothing but comparing the absolute density of a gas with that of hydrogen. Fine, do we understand this? So what about the hydrogen? Uh, hydrogen was taken, see, whenever you want to measure something, you have to have a relator. For example, if I say I want to buy 5 kgs of tomato, what is 5 kgs of tomato? 5 kgs of tomato is 5 times 1 kg of tomato. So, you have taken, you are comparing with respect to 1 kg of tomato. So, you need to have a basic measurement. For gases, the basic measurement was taken as hydrogen gas. 
we compared the weight of all the gases with respect to hydrogen gas. Question why? Because the hydrogen gas was found to be the lightest gas at that point of time. It was found to be the lightest gas. Hence, we compare all the other gases with respect to hydrogen. Fine, do we get this thing clear? Next. Right? Everyone's copied this much down, guys. Everyone's copied what I have written. Can I move on ahead, please? Let's derive something. Let's derive molecular weight. Is equal to 2 into vapor density. Let's see this derivation, guys. Can you please see this derivation now? Now, all of you, please pay attention. Vapor density. Guys, how do I define vapor density? We just did the definition of vapor density here. Vapor density is nothing but weight of given volume of gas at NTP divided by weight of same volume of hydrogen gas at NTP. That's my definition of vapor density. Right? Let us assume, let's apply Avogadro's law to it. Why? We have done Avogadro's law right now. Law. What does Avogadro's law state here? It is here. Equal volume of gases have same number of molecules. Since I am taking same volume of gas and same volume of hydrogen, they should have same number of molecules. By Avogadro's law, I can say vapor density is weight of, let's assume that a particular volume gives you n more molecules of gas. So weight of n molecules of gas at NTP, since I have taken the same volume, I will get same number of molecules of hydrogen gas also, will be equal to weight of n molecules of hydrogen at NTP. If I apply Avogadro's law, let us assume that n is 1. If I assume n as 1, I will get vapor density is weight of 1 molecule of gas at NTP divided by weight of 1 molecule of hydrogen gas at NTP. I am just substituting the value of n as 1. Right? Now, experimentally it has been found out, as I told you that hydrogen is taken as relative. So weight of one atom of hydrogen is taken as one. One molecule of hydrogen is made up of two atoms. Therefore I can say that, but weight of one molecule of hydrogen gas at NTP is two being experimentally found out, it is 2, right? Therefore, I could say that vapor density is weight of one molecule of gas at NTP divided by 2. If I cross multiply this, I will get 2 into vapor density. Weight of one molecule of gas is nothing but the molecular weight of gas is molecular weight of gas. So thus that's what we have to prove. That molecular weight is 2 into vapor density. We've derived that molecular weight is 2 into vapor density. Fine, do we get this thing here? So is this understood by us? Next, let's see something else.
Now, let's first let's understand what is gram molecular volume. It is short form written as GMV. Gram molecular volume. Gram molecular volume means the volume occupied by one gram molecular weight of gas. Right? It is the how much space will one gram molecule of weight of gas occupy at NTP is called as gram molecular weight of gas. It has been observed experimentally that for all known gases, the gram molecular volume is 22.4 liters. If I take one gram molecule of gas, it will occupy 22.4 liters. That is the space that it will occupy. So gram molecular volume is nothing but it is defined as the volume occupied by one gram molecular weight of any gas at NTP. If I take one gram molecular weight of any gas at NTP, whatever is the space occupied by it is called as the gram molecular weight. Right? It has been found that the gram molecular volume is equal to 22.4 liters at NTP. Some authors even write this as 22.4 decimeter cube. So if I take one gram molecule of a gas, it will occupy 22.4 liters or it will occupy 22.4 decimeter cube. Fine, do we get the same here? This is understood by us. Right? Everyone's finished copying everything. This part everyone's finished copying. Let's move on to the next thing. Let's see another derivation. Let's derive that. Let's derive that the gram molecular volume is 22.4 decimeter cube. How did the scientists come to this conclusion that the gram molecular volume is 22.4 decimeter cube? Right? Let's see the direction guys, please pay attention here. Vapor density. Vapor density we have already done is nothing but weight of given volume of gas at NTP divided by weight of same volume of hydrogen gas at NTP. First let's write the definition. Weight of given volume of gas at NTP divided by weight of same volume of hydrogen gas at NTP. Let us assume that this given volume is 1 liter. Right? Let the given volume, we can assume or give some value for it. Let us assume that I am taking 1 liter. So let us assume that the given volume is 1 liter. Hence, vapor density will be weight of 1 liter of gas at NTP divided by weight of 1 liter of hydrogen gas at NTP. I have to take same volume in the numerator and denominator, right? But in the previous derivation, we had derived that vapor density, guys, look at this. In the previous derivation, we had derived that vapor density is weight of one molecule of gas at NTP divided by two. It is nothing but weight of one molecule of gas at NTP divided by two. That's my vapor density. Now I can equate these two equations, guys. I can equate these two equations. If I equate them, 
I will get I am equating these two therefore I can say that weight of one molecule of gas at NDP weight of one molecule of gas at NDP divided by 2 is equal to weight of 1 liter of gas at NTP divided by weight of 1 liter of hydrogen gas at NTP. I am equating the two equations. Fine, do we get the same here? Now, it has been experimentally found out that the weight of 1 liter of hydrogen gas at NTP is nothing but 0 0.0893. It has been experimentally found that weight of 1 liter of hydrogen gas at NTP is nothing but 0 0.0. 893 I will substitute this in my equation so in that case I will get therefore weight of one molecule of gas at NTP divided by 2 is equal to weight of one liter of gas at NTP divided by 0 0.0893 I am substituting the denominator as 0 0.0893 right cross multiply now weight of one molecule of gas is nothing but the molecular weight of gas molecular weight of gas is equal to 2 into weight of 1 liter of gas at NTP divided by 0 0.0893 right people this is understood by us now 2 divided by 0 0.0893 is nothing but 22.4 so therefore I can say that molecular weight of gas is 22.4 into weight of 1 liter of gas at NTP guys how did I get that 22.4 you can do that on your calci if you want 2 divided by 0 0.0893 gives you 22.4 22.4 multiplied by 1 liter will be nothing but 22.4 liters right so in that case now 1 liter can be substituted as 1 decimeter cube therefore I can say that molecular weight of gas is nothing but weight of 22.4 decimeter cube of gas at NTP right that is what we have to prove that molecular weight is equal to 22.4 decimeter cube right thus 1 gram molecular weight of any gas therefore I can say that 1 gram molecular weight of any gas occupies 22.4 decimeter cube that's your derivation works right we will stop here for the day. Thank you very much. Switch off the thing.